Okay, so this lecture, I think we are all honored to have uh, Professor Tajkovic uh, uh, on this distinguished lecture. Uh, so we'll obviously talk more about it, but, but let's talk a little bit of our society, what we do. Um, so we have, yeah, can I kind of, yeah, okay. So we have these um, officers of our society. That's me, George, that's vice chair. She is also in the meeting. He's the secretary, treasurer is Hyming. Imran is also in the call. He is the webmaster in e-notice, e uh, who, who, the one who sends all the notices to everyone. Then we have a few industry liaisons, uh, Jonathan from Qualcomm, uh, Robert who's also there in the call, I think, from Renaissance. And then, then YK Chen, he's Alibaba. He's actually, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure uh, Professor Tekovich is familiar with YK Chen. He's, he's one of the board of governors for the uh, CAS Society. And uh, I just want to point out about uh, some of the membership, uh, you know, so we've had very strong membership in our society for all these years. So unfortunately, I think the last year we kind of dipped a bit, obviously because of the pandemic. So we, we were doing pretty good around 500 mark, but the last time, last year we kind of went to 417. So I request all the people like, you know, if you're not a member of CAS, if you're not a member of the, you know, uh, to begin with even IEEE, please sign up, it's always good. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of good events. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but we also kind of, you know, compelling reasons uh, we have, like you can see the fellows in our society within our, you know, Society of Santa Clara Valley. Uh, we have senior members, members, there's a lot to, you know, network and talk about. Uh, we also maintain a Facebook page uh, and all those notices that you just heard, Imran, uh, he just puts everything on this Facebook page. So feel free to, you know, whatever way you get the notification, you can get the notification from Facebook. Then you can also kind of, you know, our mailing list, you can subscribe to our mailing list. Imran maintains it and I think now she wants to go ahead and maintain it. So we, we, we kind of keep everything, uh, everything over here. We kind of put all our you know, information here. Uh, please feel uh, free to, and obviously and also we're looking for volunteers all the time. So I'm going to talk about it more soon. Uh, we've been posting lectures on IEEE TV and I think last couple of times I've been saying we're going to post it on YouTube. And as I speak, actually I'm loading two more lectures on YouTube. So next time when I, when I kind of give the whole thing, I'm going to have, you know, IEEE TV as well as YouTube channel just for IEEE CAS Santa Clara Valley. Uh, so the future events, I just want to talk in related to CAS Society. We have this, uh, which are happening within a couple of months. So there's an ICME happening. Uh, it's all virtual, July 5th to 5 to 9, uh, International Conference on Multimedia and, Ex and Expo. Uh, then there's an SMA uh, uh, CAD. So this one is in Germany. I think this is all as well happening in July. It's all virtual. This one is all on your CAD topics. So compact modeling, you know, algorithms for circuits and design. So it seems very interesting. Then also we have our own um, flagship event at Midwest Symposium, uh, Circuit Systems. It's gonna be fully virtual this year. That's from August 9 to 11. And then we also have the International System on Chip Conference that's gonna be a hybrid event. And that's in Vegas. And that's from 14 to 17th of September. So four very interesting uh, conferences coming up. Then I'm gonna talk about the, the call of nomination that we just sent to all our members on the IEEE. Uh, so we are looking for you know, chair, vice chair, secretary and treasurer. Um, and we seek to get as many nominations as possible. So if you are interested, please send your you know, full name with, with the email address with IEEE membership to ieee.scv.cas at gmail.com. Um, and, uh, you know, we, the open nomination period is until seven, this end of almost the next month. So it's like 25th July. Uh, we have uh, uh, a previous chair who is kind of uh, the, what do you call, election, uh, overlooking the entire election, Robert. So if you have any questions, please do send an email to him. I just want to say that in case you're not an IEEE member, that's fine. Uh, please send you, if you have interest, please send your everything. We can obviously, you can, in the meantime, you can become an IEEE member as well as CAS member, and then definitely we can, you know, uh, look into that. 
so then I want to just talk briefly about why join CAS because what's, what's the benefit that you get out of it? And, you know, uh, this is one thing which we put on our, on our website is that out of all the chapters, we were we won the best chapter in 2019, uh, chapter between the chapters one, uh, between the regions one to seven. And the amount of events that we have, obviously 2019 was a crazy year when we did so many events. But even in 2020, when there was a pandemic going around, we did really well. We had almost like, you know, seven to eight events. Uh, we did a lot of outreach events. We were kind of doing a lot of mentoring, kind of men, um, kind of going. Um, just, just give me a second. So we did a lot of mentoring events and outreach events, um, and uh, it's been uh, and throughout the year we've been busy along with everything that we can think of that we can do. Uh, So the technical talks that we had last year, again, I'm kind of putting in, in the slides, we had good talks on the, uh, on the optic, you know, on some, some of the photonics kind of events. We had obviously some circuits events on the transmitters, AD PLLs and ADCs. We had power amplifiers, some of the, from ADS uh, people. Uh, then we also had a very interesting panel talk on the telematics 5G and privacy. And then we did some outreach events that I talked about. We kind of heavily participated in the CAS student design competition, all of our members. We also traveled all the way to UC, uh, to LA to participate in USC. And we kind of help, uh, trying to help her to get the CAS chapter on go going on there. And then we've been working very closely with Santa Clara University as well on the, you know, the design competition and this year has also been very nice. We have, so far we have had, you know, including this talk, we have had almost six talks. Um, so again, the events range from, you know, circuit systems. Uh, so this was all about the blackout that happened in Texas and how we can, you know, how the IT technologies can kind of help it. And um, so there were a lot of events that's been, you know, truly enriching. Uh, we kind of learned a lot from it. So this kind of, you know, shows how many events we have had this year. And, and as I said, it's a lot of fun to talk to speakers. It's a lot of fun to be a part of the CAS. So with that, I'm going to end this, uh, my interest talk. Um, so please, uh, you know, uh, send your nominations. Uh, if you have any questions, please seek out to any of these officers. As I said, me, Imran, Robert, she, and, you know, we'll try our best to kind of uh, answer you. So with that, let's go to our main, uh, the, the topic of the day. So, I, Dr. Krakowicz uh, did mention to me that her bio was kind of <laughs> very long bio. Uh, so, I'm just gonna go try to highlight a few points. Uh, so, uh, Professor Krakowicz received a diploma engineering degree from University of Pristina, Pristina Yugoslavia in 1974. The MSc degrees in electrical engineering and computer engineering from Syracuse University, New York in 1979 and 81. And the PhD degree in electrical engineering from University of California in, at Los Angeles in 1986. Some more people waiting. Okay. Um, she's, so she's currently a professor at the School of Engineering Science at Simon Fraser University, Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada. And from 95 to 97, she was a National Science Foundation uh, and is a visiting professor at, in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, University of California, Berkeley. She was also a research scientist at Bell Communication Research, Modestown, New Jersey from 1997, and a member of technical staff at at and Bell Laboratories, uh, Murray Hill, New Jersey from 88 to 90. Her research interests include high performance communication networks, controller communication systems, computer aided circuit design and analysis and design, and theory of nonlinear circuits and dynamical systems. Uh, she has a lot of um, credentials in being the IEEE uh, editors and you know, hosting, being co-chair of so many uh, different societies, but, uh, and, uh, and she's also a life fellow of IEEE. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Tagovic. Uh, you may want to share your uh, screen. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Jha. Thank you for inviting me and thank you also, Dr. Uh, Chen for inviting 
asking me to give a talk, it's an honor for me. Uh, I know about your chapter quite a bit because very often we compete and oh, you always win. So I have no chance to win the region one through seven, but it happened twice. So I congratulate you on the great work in your chapter. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. What I'm going to do, uh, because this is a circuit system, I'm also asked to say something about IEEE. So I'm not going to spend so much, too much time, but uh, uh, just a little bit about the IEEE in general. And these are the slides that are delivered really by CAS Society. And so I want you to give us some feel about where do we stand now. So IEEE members, we have more than 420,000 members, uh, over 124,000 student members, many sections in 10 geographical regions, uh, a number of chapters. We also have student branch chapters and uh, that was established maybe 10 years ago. Well, actually students in a university can, can create a chapter associated with the society. So for example, uh, you might establish system society student branch chapter within the university. There are many branches, uh, student branch chapters, many affinity groups. And um, uh, just to mention the society membership, uh, this is a membership organization. And our, over 50% of IEEE members belong to the society. So you can become an IEEE member, you don't have to belong to society. But I usually say that belonging to the society is relatively inexpensive. Um, the, the membership is less than $20. So the bulk of the membership dues actually go quite triple dues. Um, so now let me see if, if I can do this. Uh, just give me a second because the Zoom is taking a piece of my uh, screen. So CAC Society has always been very dear to my heart because that was really for my first volunteer position within CAS. And I was just reviewing some historical data and I found out that my first meeting for the technical committee in circuits and system society was in 1995 in Seattle when I became a secretary of the technical committee on all in our circuits and systems. And I really never dreamt that in 2007, I'm going to be a president of the society, it never crossed my mind. So it's a really one of the oldest and the most important in my mind societies within IEEE. Uh, and uh, the mission is to foster technological innovation and excellence in fundamentals, emerging directions and application of circuits and systems to the benefit of humanity throughout the disciplinary community. And we really have a very broad field of interest. So this is why it's, it's so interesting to be part of CAS Society and part of the technical committees because of the broad field of interest, there is a lot of cross, cross co collaboration. Uh, so I'm going to skip this about the vision and the value. You can see all of this on the web. Uh, we do maintain a very nice website. Uh, membership benefits, uh, free CAS magazine, electronic version, free CAS society newsletter. Uh, there is, uh, we also participate with other societies. So for example, uh, RFIC virtual journal uh, is also free to the customers. RFID virtual journal, free access to CAS society conference digital library free access to CAS Society Digital Library that includes uh, a number of our transactions from the old TCAS 1 and TCAS 2 to JetCAS, transaction of, on SVT and BioCAS. There is also free access to all resources on CAS Resource Center. That's a little bit of a new platform. Uh, it has been around for a couple of years, but you might not visit the Resource Center because a lot of material is posted there. And also student members receive free access to all CAS journals. Conferences, you probably know, I think Dr. Ja mentioned a couple of conferences coming. One is Midfest that's coming. I know I have a paper with a student in Germany. Uh, so we organize a lot of conferences and the major conference is really ISCAS. And uh, if you are a CAS member, you have a reduced membership fee, um, conference registration fees. Uh, we have currently 14 technical committees. We had more in the past, but I know the idea was to consolidate them and they will promote technical activities in various areas. And it's really not very difficult at all to join a technical committee. Everybody wants volunteers. So if you're interested in any of the fields and areas where the technical committee operates, just send an email to the chair and they will, they will welcome you. I have been a member for many, many years. 
in the technical committee on all in our soccer systems and I also participate in a variety of, of activities there. Uh, chapters, we do have, I do have a local chapter in Vancouver. I established the chapter in 2001 and this year we celebrated 20 years. So after 20 years, I said quite a few chapters, 35 in regions one, 19 in region nine, that's Latin America, 36 in region 10. And so there are a variety of chapters and they have a lot of activities that you can see from your local chapter. Uh, distinguished lecture program, um, even when pandemic is over, you can invite DLP speakers to come and the CAS Society is going to cover the uh, part of the expenses. And actually it's a very nice opportunity to invite people and hear about what they do. Uh, and CAS Society has always been very supportive of the DLP program. And I remember from my time, we actually put a lot of funding into, into make, enhancing the program even 10, 10, 15 years ago when I was a, when I was a pre president. We value our students. They are actually future of CAS and future of IEEE. So there are a lot of opportunities within CAS society, uh, scholarship opportunities, travel awards, uh, special student discounts for conferences and workshops. And of course, young professionals. Uh, there are a lot of uh, activities within that affinity group. In conclusion, there are many reasons to become a CAS member. And as I mentioned, I always felt very welcome in CAS society. I always felt uh, part of the community. And even though later I became a president of other societies such as System and Cybernetic Society, and then I was a director until last year, I always had a very close connection with CAS and I really never left CAS because that was really my first society that I joined uh, from the time when I was a PhD student or I just graduated. So in conclusion, there is a reason to participate in conferences, to be informed, to receive really top level quality journals, participate in technical committees. And I would very much encourage you to do that. That was actually my first connection with CAS as organization, uh, access to emerging technical content, networking with uh, your geographic community to CAS chapters, and uh, finally professional recognition by uh, CAS awards that are very prestigious. And, um, and this is how we recognize our volunteers. So for more information, you can actually ask uh, uh, the manager, uh, uh, Britain Parkinson, and I know she's very responsive and the response to the email messages. So feel comfortable to, to contact her if you have any questions. And of course, if you have any questions, you can also ask me. So sorry to make this very fast. Um, and I'm sure you knew quite a few things about what I told you about CAS. But just to remind you, and from my personal experience, I very much encourage you to get involved because for me, that really created a community. So I do have my job at SFU, um, that I have been since 1998, but uh, my community and my, my interactions were mainly through IEEE, uh, both through Circus and System Society and more recently through System and Society. So that's the introduction. So with your permission, I would like to talk about the technical content of this event. So I want to talk about the research that I have been doing with my students. And the topic of my talk is data mining and machine learning for detecting traffic anomalies and intrusions. I put a lot of material on the web and this is why I posted the, the URL. All the papers are publicly available to download as a PDF. I also post all my talks. Uh, we also I, uh, work on software. So a lot of software tools are available. I usually say that I work from taxpayers' money. I'm paid from taxpayers' money. So everything I do more or less is publicly available. And so that's the website that this is I put it there. Uh, this, this is a roadmap of our talk. First, I would like to introduce the topic. Why is collected collection of traffic so important? It has always been important. Even in those days when AT&T had a huge network that carried telephone conversations and voice. It was important to do traffic measurements, but that was done within a company. Now that we talk about internet and we talk about not only voice, but also data, images, videos, variety of social networks that are used, we talk about different kinds of traffic. So it becomes even more important to do traffic collection, characterization, and of course, modeling. Uh, I participated in several case studies in the past, 
And so I just want to briefly, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, but uh, we collected the traffic from a local network. It's called British Columbia Network, BCNet. And we were fortunate to have collaboration with the with operation manager of BCNet. So we had a device day and we can collect the data. Uh, so that's something of a private collection that we have. Ecom is a, a, a emergency preparedness network in Vancouver. They, for example, supported the Olympics. This organization is ambulance, fire departments. So it's not really for commercial use, but uh, through collaboration with the staff in Ecom, we also got the data from that network, very different network. And then China SAP, that's from Chinese um, uh, so provider of internet services in Chinese provinces. And I had a student who actually brought the whole hard disk with the data from China SAP so that we could actually look at the internet's interesting network that was a hybrid network. It's both terrestrial and satellite. And most of the talk today, I'm going to devote to analysis of um, internet. And internet data is publicly available. And uh, there, there has been a collection over the last 20 years from two major sites in Europe and in North America. So most of the work that we are doing these days using machine learning algorithms and techniques really are dealing with the data that are publicly available to research community. Then I'll talk about machine learning models. I'm also going to mention experimental procedure. How do we do that? And it's very often through research, we actually improve the process, performance evaluation, what are we looking at when we evaluate various models. And I always put uh, something in conclusion. And for people who are interested in topic, I always also have all major references. So let me talk about traffic collection, characterization, and modeling. So traffic measurements is important to understand the characteristic of the traffic. It's really a basis for developing traffic models, especially nowadays when the traffic is so complex. Developing realistic traffic models is very important. In the old days, when we only saw voice calls carried through the network, plus some models were very reliable, they are tractable, they provide a closed form solution. So they were very much applicable uh, to uh, various uh, tools that we learned from queuing theory. But unfortunately, the traffic that we see today cannot be modeled using Poisson traffic. And I'll give you some illustration. Why is that the case? So in order to develop realistic models, we really have to do traffic measurements from deployed networks. And I usually talk about deployed networks because that's the value where you have a real network with real customers. And of course, that also brings the issue of privacy and then difficulties in collecting the data. But these kinds of measurements are the most re uh, reliable and the most valuable when you want to develop traffic models. And of course, we, we use these models in order to evaluate performance of existing and future protocols, and of course, existing and future applications. Traffic analysis uh, provides information about how is the network used. That's very much of interest to network providers because they really want to understand the behavior of the network users. And that's done in order to be able to provide the quality of service that the users expect. Prediction is a little bit more difficult. It's important to access the network capacity requirements and the deployment of network elements. And it's always used to plan future network developments. Um, traffic modeling, I'm just going to mention, at the beginning of 90s, there was a research group at Bell Communications Research. And it was led by Walter Billinger and his team. And they collected data from the backbone that connected Bellcore to the rest of the internet. They literally had shoeboxes of data because they were very much interested in mental properties of the traffic that we see nowadays and the networks carry voice and video and images. And so they found out that the traffic is not quite so light the traffic is actually fractal. And so the fractal means that the data on various time scales have very similar patterns. So you might have seen about fractals, of course, and fractals were used to create calendars. You know, they are very much used in uh, image processing. They are used in order to depict landscapes. 
but it turns out that most of the traffic that we see today on the internet is fractal. In mathematical terms, we call a stationary process exactly second order self-similar if its autocorrelation function satisfies certain properties in terms of various aggregation levels. So there is a very formal definition what we mean by saying that traffic is fractal. In addition to mathematics, we can actually look at how this looks like. So what you see in this graph, uh, in this slide, you can see three graphs. On the left-hand side, it's a time scale of four frames, which since each frame is 40 milliseconds, we are talking about the time scale of 160 milliseconds. So this is a genuine MPEG trace. And the idea to do this actually comes from a seminal paper by Walter Willinger and his team. And the paper was published in 1994. In 1995, it got the Bennett Award for the best paper in all transactions of IEEE. So it's really a seminal work where people have departed uh, from, from the idea of using Poisson model to model the traffic. So what you see on the left-hand side, it's a genuine MPEG trace, and I'm plotting the number of uh, um, bits in each frame on the vertical axis and the horizontal, horizontal axis, I'm plotting the number of the frames and each dot in this graph represents how many bits are there in four frames. And so that's reality. So let me zoom out and change the time scale from 160 milliseconds to 640 milliseconds. So I'm basically zooming out and I can see qualitatively, I see the same peaks and valleys. What you see yellow on the left-hand side is just only the piece here because we are increasing the time. And we can do this once again when I'm going to increase the time scale to uh, 64 frames. The green area in the middle, it's now this little green area here. But what's important to see is that no matter how I zoom in or zoom out, I can see this, this, this fractal behavior of the traffic. Just to tell you that that's not the case if you use Poisson model, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to synthetically generate the Poisson model for the same trace. And I can actually do a very nice match. If I choose the parameters properly, I can say that the graph on the left that you see, it's very similar to the previous graph with a genuine trace. Let me use that model on different time scales. So if you do this for 16 frames, you can see, well, not anymore so many peaks and valleys. You do this once again and you get a noise. So this is a sort of pictorial view to show you that even though I can match a Poisson model on a certain specific scale, I cannot use that model on various time scales because it doesn't capture the qualitative properties of the traffic that are fractal. So that's about the traffic. Then people also looked at the end of 99, beginning of 2000, into internet topology. Because there are two things that we are concerned in internet, traffic and the topology. And so usually people look at the internet topology on what we call autonomous system level. So we can't really look at every device, but we can look at autonomous systems. And these autonomous systems are basically university campuses, company campuses. So from by looking at the border gateway protocol routing tables, one can infer how logically the packet can travel from the source to destination, what can keep records of these autonomous systems, and you can create a graph of the internet. And that was a paper by Falutzas. These are three brothers and their collaborator, and they published it later in 2003. But the idea really came in 1999, I believe. And so that was the seminal work that uh, departed from the idea that internet in maybe is maybe a random graph, which is not completely connected graph, of course not, or small world graph, right? It turns out that internet as a graph, it's what we call a scale-free graph. So I'm going to just give you a beautiful view of the internet topology. It was done quite a long time ago. It comes from Kaida. It's an organization that collects traffic and they had a group uh, that dealt with the graphical interpretation because it was called Valerius Group. And so, for example, this is a view of the internet of half a billion nodes, 600,000 links, and you can see this beautiful and very interesting topology of the internet. Each node represents autonomous system. It means really a campus network. So it's a network of networks. And you can see that we, it has these scale properties. That means the nodes that are very connected as internet grows are going to get even more connected and isolated nodes on the edges are going to remain isolated. 
So that's what we call a scale three property. There is no limit to the degree of the node in this graph. And this is just a static view of the graph. So you can imagine how interesting it would be to actually add dynamics. And we try to do this. We try to simulate TCP and various algorithms in TCP to add the dynamics on the node. But you can imagine that it's a difficult problem. So that's about the traffic and the, the, the internet as, as a network. And I usually use internet as an example of a complex network. A little bit about studies. So these are the case studies that I have done. So BC Network, a local British Columbia network. It provides connectivity to universities, and research hospitals, and research institutions in a, what we call lower mainland. That's a network that's close to the US border. And it's quite a large network. So you can see that it covers over 1,400 kilometers in British Columbia. Uh, we were fortunate to have a collaboration with them. Uh, we also were fortunate to get a grant to, call it, to buy a device that was not that uh, cheap. And, uh, but you really have to have connections with the organization to let you do that. So you can see that uh, we take 30% of the optical signal. And from that 30% of the signal, we can infer the, the IPs and the time uh, uh, moments um, when the packet arrives. IPs have to be sanitized and matched. So there is a lot of, there is a lengthy process to get permission to do that because this is operational network. Providers one, two, and three are actually real customers. And uh, in order to preserve the, the, um, uh, the, the privacy issues, we really have to map, not we, but the people who are collected before we got the data, we had to map IP addresses. One thing that is preserved in this measurement is inter-arrival times and the size of the bytes per packet. Um, and uh, you can see that we did, uh, we had two boxes and uh, what we were interested in was a collection from at that time, 10 gigabits per second. And we are reviving this project in hope that we are going to be able to collect also from 100 gigabits per second connections. Uh, how is it done? Always with hardware. It would be very difficult to collect the traffic in terms of number of bytes, inter-arrival times, on such a high speed links if you do not, if you use a software. So this is an example, this is FPGA. That's actually a part of that element. It's uh, called data acquisition and generation card. And that card enables us to collect every single packet that arrived in terms of the size of the bytes in that packet and the arrival time. So the timestamp is accurate. And uh, we, look, we look at the point process. That means we are collecting the the, the events as they happen. Uh, now the study was an ECOM network, very different network, different behavior. This is a, a emergency preparedness network. Most of the calls are voice calls. And so these are usually group calls. We are talking about police coming to the site of crime site, the site of the accident. And so the group is going to have these push to talk devices. And these talks are very short within that group and we were fortunate to have data from there. Unfortunately, we cannot share the data, but we were able to publish from the data. So what we look at is call establishment, channel assignment, call drop, emergency calls. And so just to give you a feel about what is the network that we talk about, you can see I'm talking from Burnaby today and you see the Burnaby's um, using ECOM for police and for ambulance. Other municipalities might use it also for the fire and so it's a real network, real deployed network that use for emergency preparedness. Any 911 call would go to that center that's located uh, in Burnaby. Uh, China sat another study. It was uh, interesting to us because we got a lot of data uh, from the network operations center that was located north of Beijing, from the network that provided services to internet cafes in various Chinese provinces. So I'm not going to tell you all the details. It's just, it was very interesting because the network is a hybrid network. So you can see this terrestrial part, network operations center where the collection was done, internet and a web server on the internet. And the request is usually a small amount of data going up. And what comes down to the satellite is the web page of the movie that was supposed to be downloaded. And you can see some of the tricks that are used in order to enable TCP in order to operate correctly in this environment. So we talk about IP tunneling, about TCP splitting and TCP spoofing. Some of the tools 
that I use in order to enable TCP that was originally designed for wireline networks to operate in this hybrid environment. And let me talk now about traffic anomalies and intrusions and come up to, to, to the latest collection that I mentioned on my roadmap, and that's it, actually data from the internet. So we looked at the early uh, uh, events that brought internet down. These are quite known events such as SLAMA in 2003, NIMDA Quadrant 1, they took internet down for a prolonged period of time and affected very much major sites such as yahoo.com, newyorktimes.com. We also look at some electrical failures, whether computer worms and viruses are intentional, usually bad intentions. Electrical failures do not necessarily mean that they're intentional. It just happens. Uh, electrical failure, for example, caused that the traffic station south of Moscow uh, had an electrical failure in May of 2005, and that created a ripple effect that the internet connectivity was down. And uh, very recently in Pakistan in 2021, there was a power outage and um, that also caused internet uh, disconnectivity and anomaly. Ransomware attacks are very much uh, in news these days and uh, they are different from worms and viruses. We were looking at two attacks, one in 2007 called WannaCrypt and more recently Westrock. And it turns out that they are more difficult to analyze because it's more difficult to establish when they happen and when they happen the last for a prolonged period of time. There are actual, actually other uh, uh, anomalies such as uh, prefix hijacks, mis misconfigurations. Sometimes the routers are misconfigured. Not, not, these are not necessarily malicious uh, intents. So detecting these anomalies is important in cybersecurity, of course, and uh, these uh, techniques have gained recently very uh, visible attention. So they have been successfully classified using various machine learning algorithms and the rest of the talk I'm going to devote to the algorithms that we try to use in order to analyze the data. Data sets come from RIPE and Outfields. Uh, RIPE is, uh, has centers located in Europe it stands for ESO uh, European uh, Networks. And RAUTFUS is a project from uh, um, University of Oregon. Uh, they have been collecting data over the last two decades. And um, the, the collection sites for RAUTFUS are mainly located in North America. And for a while, we were also interested to see what's the difference for the same event. So we were trying to look at the collection sites in Europe and collection sites in North America for the same event to see what is the difference. And of course, usually if you go to the collection site closer to the event, the collection site is more accurate in the sense that it can actually more visibly show that there is anomaly. Um, I'm going to mention Slaman in the code red, there are code red one and code red two, Vanakrit, Westrock, Moscow Blackout, Pakistani. And also we also looked at NSL KDD data set. That's a data set from UC Irvine. It has been very much used in imaging community for image processing, but they also have some data that they use in order to, to collect some network data. And it's an improvement for KDD99 data set. More recently, we were looking at the testbed. This is a Canadian uh, cybersecurity institute, and uh, they have a collection site from uh, last three years. It's not three last anymore, it's 17, 18, and 19. And this is a synthetic data. They had a test bed in the lab. They could recreate a variety of denial of service attacks. And we were interesting to see how are these tools that we have uh, applicable to the data that are collected in such a controlled environment. And of course, BCNet. In BCNet, we never saw any anomalies. So we sometimes use this as a data uh, to show the regular crap. Uh, this uh, CIC, it's a Canadian Institute for Cybersecurity Datasets. And so these are the data sets we use. Just to give you a feel when this happened, these are quite long data sets. And what's most interesting is the var garden variety of anomalies that they actually recreated. So it's 17 and 18, they have GoldenEye, slow HTTP tests, slow worries. In 2019, they concentrated on denial of service attack and distributed denial of service attack. So basically we were looking at the variety, a large variety of, of attacks and worms and viruses that they could recreate. 
usually what we do when we look at the data set, we actually try to display it like this. So you can see, for example, the slammer in 2003 collected from uh, right and uh, collected from route views. On the top row is right, on the bottom is route views. We are looking at two features, number of announcements and number of pre uh, announced prefixes. And you can see at the time when the event happened in January 25th of 2003, you can see increased activity, both when you look at the collection sites in right and the right views. And the same is for a uh, number of uh, prefixes. Usually volume features indicate that something is happening. And so uh, if there is an increase in volume in terms of announcements and prefix, uh, announced prefixes, usually it's indication that there is anomaly. Uh, Moscow blackout was more difficult to identify. It lasted for four hours uh, in May 25th. And how do we identify this? We don't really identify it by looking at these graphs. This is just illustration. We read uh, announcements, email addresses, newspapers in order to figure out where the event happens. So this is just illustration. And then we can actually look at the event and say, okay, uh, we are going to look at two days before, two days after, we are looking at the event. We are going to assume a very brute approach, brute force approach, that everything inside the window is anomaly. And I know we can do better and we are looking at this how to do better. But usually when we identify the window anomaly, we would assume that everything in that window is anomaly. Ransomware, more difficult. Usually these events last for a prolonged period of time. That you will see later on that they are not very easily identifiable. And so this is, for example, a banner clip that happened in 2017. And um, of course, within this window, there are many events that are regular, but we know from the resources, from the sources and announcements that uh, banner clip happened in May um, of 2017. And this is a view from the right and view from route views. So even though we talk about two different collection sites, you can see that the events and the activities. So this is what we usually we do. We look at the days before attack, days after attack. We look 60, 40 for training and testing. That's what uh, the best performance is. Usually people take 80, 20. This is a time series data. So for our data, the best performance of these algorithms happen if we take 60% of anomalies for training and 40% of anomalies for testing. Uh, just uh, some feel about the size of the data sets. So for RIPE and route views, um, BGP data sets such as Code Red 1 in the Islama, we talk about smaller data sets, but these are really major events that, that have been, they were noticed uh, 20 years ago. And of course, one cannot really take internet now using the same tricks, but the elements um, are useful in, for us to understand what happened. Banacrypt and blackouts. Uh, this is, we talk about, uh, uh, the, the, these are just details about what are regular and anomaly events, how many minutes they last, right? So how many points we took for training and for testing, um, and of course the collection date. In a cell KDD data set, it's a benchmark. So uh, you can see that we are talking about a larger data set now. Uh, they have separated the data set into data set for training and data set for test. And also, there is also a smaller data set called test minus 21, which proved to be very difficult for some algorithms. And so as a test, we are also applying our method to see how, how do these routine techniques work if we work with a more difficult data set. And uh, just to give you a feel about the variety of attacks that were simulated at the Canadian Institute for Cybersecurity. So you can see various attacks, various names, and of course, we are talking about larger number of events. For example, in 2018, we talk already about more than a million points. And as I mentioned, this is in a controlled environment and the benefit of data set is really recreation of very specific attacks uh, that are known by the names in the cyber community. Um, so let's talk about the models. I know I'm running a bit late, but I uh, also want- Professor okay. Tarkovich. Maybe yes. like, let's take a break and ask if anyone has questions. There are two questions already on the chat. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, so we can do Dave, a break. Let me see the chat because- uh, Maybe Dave can ask himself because I think there are a couple okay. of questions from Dave. Dave, do you Please want to go ahead and ask? 
Hey, Dave, can you hear me? I can see, I can see. Or oh, you can see his questions maybe, yeah, I can go, just go ahead. Okay, I see now your chat, I didn't see it before. That's okay. Uh -huh. so what is the autocorrelation function and what does it mean? So in autocorrelation function, you can actually do the binning. So depending on how many points you put together, you can calculate this autocorrelation function for various values of mean m. And then you can see if that auto for m going to infinity, if that autocorrelation function goes to constant, that means you have this uh, second order self symbol. Uh, I hope I shall answer uh, the question. And there is also a question about BGP announcement. Okay, BGP has, uh, it's a simple protocol, right? So we talk about a uh, couple of messages that they use in BGP. And BGP announcements is actually when a router announces a route. So when you do the routing in internet, this uh, routing protocol uh, calls for routers to announce the, the paths. So BGP announcement means I'm announcing that the path to that router uh, is the path to take based on either Bellman Ford or Dystract algorithm, depending on the algorithm. Uh, the NLRI prefix is another uh, information that's exchanged between routers. I hope I'm answering the questions in the, um, are you happy with my answers? Sorry. I think Dave is not responding, but then we have another question from Haiming is. Yeah, let me, let me get out of the laser pointer because. Um, yeah, Dave is. I cannot, I cannot open the chat. So That's I, all right. So I, maybe I can, I can talk to you. I mean, I, I can kind of um, say the question that. Uh, um, yes, please. So Haiming is asking what statistics is collected when calculating autocorrelation in, in ABAP question, the question that you just answered okay. to okay. Dave. Yes. Okay, so it's uh, so this was a direct message to me, and unfortunately, I cannot open it. A new message. What statistics is collected and calculated what are the in the above question? Well, you have the trace, you have the series, right? You have a time series. And when you have a time series, you have information about how many bytes are in the packet, right? So I'm going to look at this time series. And going to going to look at calculating the the statistics for the time series because your traffic collection is nothing else by the time series. Usually we collect two statistical information. One is how many bytes are per packet, and another one is looking at interarrival times. So usually when we want to do traffic modeling, right, we can look at the size of the packet. In old days, it was a duration of the phone call. And we can look at the inter-arrival times between packets. And in the old days, that was actually the, the, distance, the time interval between two calls. So you look at this statistic, statistical process and you can calculate as for any other time series, you can calculate statistical properties, mean, variance, autocorrelation. Uh, does this, so this is similar. Uh, well, it is not a Poisson model, right? Um, it is really a fractal. It's not, it's Poisson model has a close form. You can actually express the model in terms of equation, Poisson equation, right? In this case, we have other indicators to show the fractal behavior, such as first parameter, we look at the variance. So, okay. And maybe we can talk about it after the talk, but we are talking about statistical properties of, of processes such as time series. And you can look at it as any other time series. Do I answer the question is at the best of my ability? Okay. Professor Tawaskovi, I have one question. Uh, so I'm more from the hardware background. So in the hardware, when you have this, you know, you talk about this 10 GBPS and, uh, you know, uh, the links that the high speed links, but what, you know, we've been, there was a previous job I had where we were looking for at one TBPS, you know, more than that speed. So where does Are the- Are you talking about this slide? This one in the previous few slides where you showed the, the high speed exactly. link with 10 GBPS. Yes, for example, yeah. right here, right? Okay. So what if, how does the network collection differ when you go to really, really high speeds? You know, what you're talking about, Terra? Yeah. This was a collection that was done already a long time ago. I so see. this time, the collection, uh, they, they had two links, 10 gigabits per second and one gigabit per second, okay. right? 
And so in order to collect everything what happens on this 10 gigabit per second, you need a special purpose hardware. So we had to buy the box. The box is like half a table, right? It's a huge box. Yes. And so that box actually enabled the collection. And more importantly, how to get the data once you collect it out. So input output of these devices is also very important, mm -hmm. right? And so the collection is done using the hardware. So you can see that it's quite sophisticated. And at that time, it cost like $60,000 to buy the device. Oh, wow. Okay. And so how you do it by separating a signal. See here, the signal. Uh -huh. 30 signal is taken, and it goes through the filtering device, and it, it comes to the capture device. So the customers do not see that you're actually taking 30% of the signal, optical signal out. But that signal will carry information about the number of packets, packet headers, size of the packets. Uh, in the packet header, there is information about protocol use on different layers, uh, inter-arrival time between packets. Mm -hmm. uh, my answer is no. How is it done? I think that's proprietary. I mean, that's why the device costs sixty thousand dollars. But I just know that uh, that this is how it's done. They have these FPGAs, they have interfaces, they have a socket for time synchronization. So it's quite sophisticated piece of hardware. So the interesting point then, is when, the, when the links go really high speed, let's say even 100 times and what you what you showed, then where is the bottleneck? Is, is the bottleneck gonna be in this, the one that's gonna collect the data, the, you know, the data acquisition system? Or is it going to Usually be the bottleneck, Sorry, go ahead. No, I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I think usually the bottleneck is input out. Okay. That means once you collect the data, how do you get it out? Mm -hmm. So I was involved in a, a collection many, many years ago when I worked for Bell Communications Research. We went to um, a national lab in Los Alamos to collect the data from a big time high performance network. And the worst thing was how do you get the data out to high speed uh, tape? And that's usually a bottleneck, taking the data out of this collecting device to the storage device. That's my experience, at least for the speeds. Uh, you are now asking me what would be a speed if we talk about gigabits per second. Maybe the device cannot even measure 100 gigabits per second. I didn't follow up with the company was called Embase. I didn't follow up with them uh, later on, but I know at that time, 10 years ago, we bought a device from them. They had a couple of... Uh, uh, companies on the market that were doing monitoring and building the hardware. And at that time, we decided to buy it from Endes. And um, that's all I know about it. Sure, that is going to be possible so to measure the price on 10, 100 gigabits per second. At this moment, I have somebody who is looking at this to try. Okay. We do not know if the device can measure sure. 100 gigabits. Okay. Any more questions? Am, am I connected? Yes, you're, you're connected. You're May I continue now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Well, please to cover a little bit about machine learning, right? So uh, we use a variety of machine learning models. We concentrate on deep learning and we look at multi-layer recurrent neural networks. And so we look at the convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, we believe networks and very recently autoencoders. And they all belong to this family of deep learning algorithms. Um, in the past, we also looked at support vector machines. They are very robust, but a bit slow because uh, our goal is really to look at the fast algorithms. So at the onset of anomaly that a system administrator can take the router down and prevent that anomaly from spreading to the customers. Uh, we did long short-term memory. We look at also the version with bidirectional gated recurrent unit and bidirectional GRU. More recently, we look at another family, gradient uh, boosting, boosting decision trees, such as XGBoost, CADBoost, and we, we, we have some results for a lot BGM. And I also wanted to mention something else. Uh, instead of going deep, the couple of years ago, a group from Macau, I introduced, we looked at the 
DLS. So it's a departure from deep learning. Instead of going deep with your network, one can actually go broad. So this is how the deep neural network looks like, just to give you a feel that we are not using too many layers. For example, to do analysis of BGP worms and viruses, such as Codred Nimda, Codred 1, Slama and Nimda, we, look, we use only 37 RNNs. Let me get my pointer. 37 for NSL KDD 109. In all cases, we use the same number of fully connected ray, ray, layers, 80, 32, and 60, right? And so that's how our network is built. So it's really not that we are looking at thousands and thousands of these hidden nodes. Uh, this is just a view of a long short term memory. It was introduced in 1999. It has not been used for a long time until people get the tools and the hardware that actually enable running these long short term memory cells. That's how it looks like. You see the input, you can see the output, right? A variety of functions inside. They are all stuck between the input layer and output layer. There is a nice mathematical theory behind. So we can calculate the forget gate, the input gate and the output gate. So these are the expressions. There is a logistic function that's used, sigma. Xt is a current input vector. H e minus one is a previous output vector. And of course, the matrices and bias vectors that have to um, Output actually decides if the information is going to be stored or not. This is why we call it long short term memory. Cell state is calculated. And finally, we have the output of LSTM, LSTM, LSTM cell. GRU is a simplified version of LSTM. Uh, it requires fewer number of operations, but it has the same accuracy as, as LSTM. So we also evaluate that one, um, just for you to know that there is math behind this and a lot of people in control theory are actually very much interested in finding out why these mappings work. Do they have a fixed point? Why do they converge? Um, and so just to mention that mathematical theory behind is really in place. And sometimes we forget that this is not only about running running experiments, but there is a math theory behind. And uh, it will be very simple than LSTM. And broad learning system, that's a sort of novelty. It was introduced in December of 2017. And you can see that actually we talk about broad system instead of deep. We talk about map features and enhancement nodes. These are specific names for the nodes. The uh, circles in peak indicate a very interesting property of the broad learning system, and that's incremental learning. That means if I have new input, I can calculate these nodes without recalculating all the other weights. And so they are marked in color here to indicate that these nodes actually happen if you want to add new input. And that's why BLS is very much uh, applicable to large data sets. And you want to train your network with a smaller data set, and then once you train it, you can actually add new input and you don't have to recalculate everything. Uh, originally, this, there, there are many flavors these days of uh, BLS. Um, and uh, just to give you mathematical expressions, um, um, we do talk about map features, enhancement nodes, input nodes. And the most important thing, we don't do uh, pseudo uh, backpropagation. We actually do pseudo inverse. So instead of using backpropagation that's used in previous deep learning networks, more pernal pseudo inverse actually can be can used to calculate inversion of the matrix say X, it's not a square matrix. And that makes these mod, uh, systems very fast. There are a variety of extensions. Um, one can actually add some depth. So this is an in interesting example when we can do cascades of map features, we can do cascades of enhancement nodes, we can do cascades of both if we want to add some depth. So it's not only that this uh, network is broad, we can add depth. And in our cases, we don't use many, more than 10 or 20 of these cascades in order to improve the performance. Uh, extensions, we, this is our contribution to the algorithm. We actually look at the extension of BLS when we add variable features, we add a feature selection algorithm in front in order to enhance the performance. And we can do the same for the cascades. Um, these are just mathematical expressions. And let me just mention the experimental procedure. So this is what I 
we usually do, we take a data set, we do partition of the data set, there is a lot of data processing in the meantime, very, we were very much in favor of understanding the feature selection, what features are important. We use a variety of machine learning algorithms to do training. Of course, we do cross-validation. We still do tenfold cross-validation. Our data is not that large, so it's possible to do so, even if we use, but we also use a cyber supercomputers. We have one at SFU in order to do this uh, tenfold cross-validation. We create a model. And after the model, we do classification. What it means, it means I want to classify whether the point is regular or normal. These are the steps. We use a variety of performance indicators, accuracy, F-score, sensitivity, recall, true positives, true negatives. There are many of them. Uh, importance of features. You can see, for example, in this data from the CIC 2018, you can see that not all features are important. If one can calculate the feature importance, and in this specific example, minimum forward segment size of the packet was the most important features. So it's important to actually understand which features are important. So combination of features also, also can indicate whether you can do clustering. So in this case, on the left-hand side, we have a three-dimensional plot from SLAMA. We look at the number of withdrawals. That's one of the features for the BGP protocol. Average path length, average length that the packet has, has to travel between source and destination. Number of announcements, announcing routes. And you can see if we work with these three features, the separation between regular class, which is blue, and anomaly class, which is red, is visible. And the same stands if you look at the route use. Such is not the case, for example, in um, blackouts, you can see that the separation is not that easy, but it's even worse in case of uh, uh, um, ransomware. And that's why probably these algorithms have difficulty doing the classification because it's very difficult to separate the classes that are normal with uh, regular. And this is, uh, this is a case from this uh, synthetic, uh, 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 the test bed data from the CIC data sets. And it's always interesting to look at the separation to see whether algorithm will perform well or not. Some parameters that we use just to give you a feel that it's possible to reproduce the data. We are not talking about huge number of features, right? So this is, for example, the SLAMA. We talk about 100 map features. If we use eight features, 30 if you use 16, and 40 if you use 37, we usually experiment with the number of features. The smaller number of features, the faster the algorithm can be trained but the accuracy and export in general will suffer. Um, these are the best parameters for incremental BLS. It's a little bit more complicated than ordinary BLS, uh, just to give you a feel that we are not really talking about thousands of steps. So it's, it's very much doable, doable. So let me just uh, look at the performance. Um, so what you see on this graph, it's a uh, data set from 2017. On the vertical axis, we talk about performance in terms of accuracy and F-score. Accuracy is blue line um, for BLS. A score is dotted line, blue for BLS. And we also look at the training time. As on the horizontal axis, we see a number of features. And of course, if you increase the number of features, in this case, data set, we had 78 features. You can see that we increase the accuracy and F-score right, in both cases, but the price to pay is the training time increases. So the training time, for example, for BLS increases, this is a blue line, as the number of features increases, but incremental BLS does a, better, does a little bit better, and that's what the advantage of incremental BLS is. So this is a sort of graphical representation of the performance in terms of accuracy, F-score, and the training time. So this is a more recent study uh, about uh, performance results for SLAMA. So you can see a garden variety of tools that we use. The last four sets of graphs is actually something that we have done locally by introducing the, the features. Uh, what we look at the, is accuracy and F-score. Uh, light blue is accuracy, dark blue is F-score. And this is specifically for SLAMA. And we have done this for the viruses. Uh, then we have done it for test. KDD test data set uh, for KDD minus 21, the difficult one. 
just to give you a feel, what are we talking about? What are the percentages of, uh, uh, of this uh, classification? 2017, 18, and 19, as you can see immediately that this is from a test bed. This is not a real situation. So the benefit of this test uh, data set is a variety of attacks. And you can see because it's really not real setting that the algorithms do much better. So we are talking about over 90% of uh, 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 percentage of accuracy in F-score, similar for 2018. So I want to conclude because I took a bit longer time. So I talk about data collection from deploying networks and they're used to evaluate network performance. I talk a little bit about characterization and modeling of traffic. When we talk about traffic, we use old fashioned telephone terms, inter-arrival times and call holding times. Now, when we talk about traffic for internet, we talk really about inter-arrival times between packets and the size of the packets. We also look the, not only at the trends and the, the findings uh, that departed from using Poisson as a, as a model for traffic that we see today on the internet, but to look at the fractal behavior. We also looked at the internet topology and the, the richness of the topology, even when we look at it on a static point, from the static point of view. And then the rest of the talk, we talk about classifying traffic and network anomalies. Some of the uh, uh, algorithms that we use, some deep learning algorithms, such as LSTM, GRU, uh, some also autoencoders, uh, a new algorithm uh, that's not a deep, deep learning, it's actually a broad uh, learning algorithm and variations that we, we in, in, in included in order to actually capture the importance of the, of the features. So this is variable feature BLS and this is variable cascade features BLS. These are two algorithms that we enhanced. So just a summary that is BLS, it's very fast. It's as fast as autoencoders. And um, in BLS and its extension got a better performance and shorter training time because of the wide and deep structure. So they offer comparable performance to GRU and LSTM, but they are much faster. But of course there is a price to pay while increasing the number of features and enhancement nodes and the groups led to better performance, it actually required additional memory and time. So these are variations that we introduced. So we can actually have a variable number of map features and groups of map features. Very often they outperform the recurrent neural networks and other BLS models. Uh, these uh, models with variable features uh, have up to 15% better score in case of NSL KDD. Um, and uh, they offer higher accuracy, even though like GBM has the faster training time. So what's the advantage is really the ability to derive generalized models by using various subsets of input data to generate map features. And so they provide an easy process to create models. So I usually put references, first the data sources, as I mentioned, right route use are publicly available. NSL KDD is also available. It's the table test dates, 17, 18, and actually 19 also data sets available at the request. And I usually, I, I also want to give a credit to Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis or CAIDA for the pretty graphs that I showed you. Reference tools, usually most of the tools, tools are publicly available. We use Python, PyTorch, Zebra. We create our own tools such as C Sharp in order to create the matrices and features. We posted our data that is clean and ready for analysis to IEEE data port. And I want to give a credit to the uh, originators of BLS because they also posted some of the software on their own website. If you're interested in intrusion detection, I put, I put here a major uh, surveys and tutorials because they are easy to read. And so these are some of the recent surveys uh, about specifically about intrusion detection. And uh, in terms of deep learning, I only listed here the fundamental work uh, related to algorithms that, uh, that uh, are used. And actually, LSTM was introduced in 97, I don't know if I said 97 or 99. So you can see it's an old algorithm, but it became very popular these days with a, a revival of uh, artificial intelligence and the use of hardware in order to be able to do 
such a large number of calculations in a short time. Uh, references to, um, gray, uh, to the autoencoders at the top and uh, BLS comes from Philip Chen and his group. And as I mentioned, it was introduced in December of 2017. And in the meantime, they had two papers in IEEE transaction on neural networks and learning systems. Uh, we all a little bit for this work. I have been working on this for the last few chapters. Um, I think they are easy to read. The first book chapter is about data and collection. The second is about the algorithms that we use at that time. We in the meantime, use some of the algorithms. And there is a journal publication coming in July at the journal in selected areas um, uh, in communications. And I also have a lot of papers put on my webpage various conferences and these are really my students they do majority of the work because it takes time to build the data to clean the data to put it together to map it to graph it so i want to give a credit to my students and my current students are my phd student jay dali my master degree student Anna laura gonzalez rios and i think camila dachentieva has also worked on it so these are my current my current students actually putting a lot of time into making this presentation possible. So that's all what I want to say, and I'm leaving you with a pretty graph of the internet from Kaida to show you how interesting the network is, how complex its behavior is, both in terms of connectivity and graphs, and in terms of traffic that it carries. So I'm sorry that I took longer, and um, that's all what I want to say. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Tarkovich. Uh, I think if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, I have one. Yes. So um, for the deep neural network, um, is your work primarily in modeling or were you able to implement this on, let's say, a silicon or an FPGA platform? I don't have, unfortunately, I don't do hardware. So. Okay. It would be very nice to do that. And I think a lot of groups are working on that to actually implement these kind of things, these algorithms in hardware. And this is where the future is because most of the things I told you today is about supervised learning, but uh, labeling is a very time consuming task and it's not always accurate. So we are now looking at semi-supervised and unsupervised learning. And also these algorithms have to be fast and uh, everything what's it would be great to do it in hardware. And I, I know that people are working in hardware implementation. But no, in my group, we only do software. Got so we these algorithms using software. But we also have a GPU. And we also have access to the supercomputer at Simon Fraser University, one of several in Canada. So sometimes for some uh, intensive task, we actually use a supercomputer. But most of the algorithms are running on simply CPU. OK. So I guess if you had to benchmark those algorithms in terms of what it would mean if this was to be implemented in hardware and in terms of resource it would require to be implemented on a chip or an FPGA and power consumption, you wouldn't be able to forecast that just yet without having yeah, to- you ask, You're asking the wrong person. I worked on a hardware a long time ago. I worked in Bell Communications Research on an ATM switch, a synchronous transfer mode switch. But that was my only hardware stand. I worked with circuits in the past, but I always look at the theoretical analysis. So I cannot, I will not be able to tell you how much it would take to implement it in hardware. But definitely, I know that's the way to go. Unfortunately, I don't have the research tools uh, to do the hardware implementation. Yeah. But yes, that would be, that's the way to go. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So uh, are you suggesting that we should use BLS and instead of using deep learning with neural yeah. networks? Okay, I have to tell you, let me stop sharing, okay? So that I can, I can actually talk to you. The person who came with BLS is my good friend and colleague from System Menace and Benetti Society. And I was curious to find out, is his algorithm going to be able to do something for time series? Because he applied this algorithm to image processing. And so that's how it started. Am I saying it's better? I'm saying it gives comparable performance. 
okay? But it's faster, okay? So that's what I'm saying. Comparable performance, but it's faster. So if you are looking for the best performance, no, BLS is not going to give you the best performance, but it's as fast as some autoencoders. Uh, autoencoders are very fast also. Because deep learning with neural networks is complex to use. So BLS might be yes. simpler. Well, I think, I think if you want, yes, BLS is a structure. You can actually, you don't have to have it only flat and cast. I know that it's, when it's applied to image processing, you have to work with a large number of nodes. But in our case, we really have a time series that we analyze. So when earlier you asked me all the statistical properties of a time series, what this traffic, it's a time series, right? It's just a statistical process, right? So it's not two dimensional, it's one dimensional. So for us, BLS worked very well. But now we departed a little bit from BLS and we are looking at autoencoders and we are finding that they're equally fast as BLS. Okay. Okay. So it really depends. And you can see from a variety of examples I showed you, everything depends on a traffic trace. It depends on the data. And it's a big question is why certain algorithms work better with one data set and work worse with another data set? And I do not have an answer. I only know that until now, we did very brute force approach. Everything within a window that we learned is anomaly, we considered anomaly. And that's really not reality. Inside that window, when anomaly happened, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of traffic that was regular. And so now we are trying to figure out, can we actually do better when we do labeling? Can we label inside that window that certain events are regular events? And so that's why we are looking at semi-supervised learning techniques now. So there is always room for improvement. Have I answered your question? Yeah, very good. Uh, and the other question is, I was I, I worked on a project and we published a paper with some Stanford professors. Maybe you know them, John Schiaffi and Andrea Goldsmith. Yeah, and, uh, I know them. Yeah, and uh, we published a paper about how to use sort of learning in the five, at the five layer. Ethernet 5, how to learn about the traffic, uh, traffic conditions for given flows so that you can predict the bandwidth that they will consume. And if they consume less than what is reserved for them, we can give that extra bandwidth to some other flows who, are, who need that bandwidth and you got less bandwidth reserved for them. So we published the first set of results the problem, of course, is lack of data sets. And the second problem, how you implement such a kind of mm. uh, bandwidth prediction algorithm in the phi, Ethernet phi. Yes, difficult. Very difficult. OK, is that, are there any more questions? I think it's quite late for Professor Tarkovic, so I think we, we can... Sorry, we, we started with the presentation about IEEE and everything else. And That's all right. I'm sorry uh, about taking more time. No, 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 I, I think I think, I I think it was a great talk. Everybody loved the talk. I'm, it was uh, very well attended. Um, so if, if you don't have any more questions, then we can uh, say, I want to say wait, thank you to uh, Professor Tarkovic. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, we're so fortunate to have you and give us a talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting yeah. me and thank you for attending my talk and thank you for the questions. Absolutely. Amir, Do you have something? Yeah, I, mean, I, I had a question for um, the speaker. Um, how do you, I mean, isn't all this modeling kind of, um, kind of circular? Because you make certain assumptions, then you model it and then you show that, you know, your assumptions are correct. So how do you get around that? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not really saying my assumptions are correct. Our, our accuracy of F score is not 100%, right? So what I'm trying to say within a certain window, uh, if you tell me there is something happening with which accuracy and F score, I can tell you, yes, you do have anomalies in that window. But I don't see what's circular about it. Well, because you, you make the assumption, let's say you assume that as a Poisson regression model, or you assume that you're 
the certain randomness or all these things. Uh, how do you? No. no, we don't. We don't assume any Poisson properties of this. Okay. No, no. Well, what I do you assume I, for your? What do you assume for your data, plotting model? This data is all collected from real sites. So what okay. we have is the traffic data. These are data from collection sites from a real internet, right? Okay. So there are All no right. assumptions. This is real data that are collected by certain collection sites in both networks, right, and routers, right? So the collection sites are in Europe and North America. There are many of these collection sites. So what we get is a, is a trace from these collection sites. And then from the reports, we find out that during that time, there was an anomaly that was detected, right? And we are trying to figure out, right, within that period of time, when the traffic was collected and people were reporting that there was something happening, can we say with certain probability, right, based on these machine learning algorithms, whether these were anomalies or not? But we have no assumptions about traffic. Traffic is collected. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's a real trace from, from real data from deployed networks with real customers. Except the Canadian Institute for Cybersecurity that actually did this in a control setting in a test bed. All right, thank you. It's 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 a time series data that's collected from real network. Yeah. Uh, we no about traffic. So, any more questions? I think that's a great work. So, any more questions for anyone uh, from anyone? Otherwise, I think we will probably call it off. I think we've gone. Uh, I think we we we, we took we took a lot of time. Yes, so I'm think, sorry about it. No, I, even I'm responsible for it. So, uh, again, thank you so much, Professor Tekovic. It was wonderful to have you yeah. here, and uh, we'll have more presentation from you in future. Yeah, I, I hope we all hope so. Thank you very much for inviting me. Sure. And I will I not complete you. your chapter in future because I always lose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like your beach. You I like my beach, <laughs> yes. I want, to, I want to relax all the time. That's my idea. <laughs> and it's even moving. It's a video. It's not even yes. a small picture. No. Uh, by the way, before you leave, Professor, do you have a specific tool for time series? Do you use for a specific what? tool? There are many companies who have to provide time series databases and time series tools. Do you use a specific one? No, uh, what I use are these machine learning algorithms. Okay, thank you. And we implement these algorithms or post them on the web. Uh, some of them we implemented, we also post them on our website. So basically I'm using these algorithms for analysis of this time series, which is really the traffic that I talk about. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, I'll also thank Hesham. I mean, he's, he's been very, um active asking a lot of questions so thank you hesham i hope to see you again uh, do not miss out on the other you know talks <laughs> absolutely thank you very much sure thank you very much all stay safe all right, and bye everyone for having me yeah, i'm in yes i'm in can we stay after the call some of the XCOM people uh okay maybe like a yeah. few minutes and i, I yeah. can leave so you can all right back. yes go ahead thank you very much thank bye you so bye. much uh, stay bye. safe and healthy bye bye, bye. bye. thank you